So climate change for Christians, looking at impacts, but also responses. I'm going to go through the science super quickly for two reasons. One, it's very easy to get bogged down in a lot of detail. And two, I'm not a scientist, so I think I should uh, just defer to people who know what they're talking about and have done that in the presentation. But before I start, I just want to give you um, two very quick words of caution. Most of us already know everything we need to know about climate change, the impacts, the severity and the risks that we're facing. Um, more scientific information, another article about climate change impacts isn't what's required to move us to action, actually. So that's number one. Don't feel like you just need to know more and more and more and more before you start talking with others about climate change or taking action. Um, you already know enough, and I'm going to present what I think we all know in four very simple propositions. And the second thing, just to say, if one of the things that you're hoping to get out of this webinar is how to have a discussion with somebody who maybe isn't totally convinced about climate change, um, in general, it's not a scientific argument that will persuade someone to care about climate change or take action about climate change. It's much more to do with how they perceive themselves, what they identify as significant values and identities that they have, and how they perceive you and the groups you're part of. So, if you have a relationship of trust, they're more likely to be interested in listening to you. And while the science is important, um, Augustine, St. Augustine basically calls it God's other book. We have the scripture and we have science telling us about the world that God has made. Um, scientific arguments themselves aren't what's going to persuade people to take climate change seriously and respond. So let's move in. Four propositions about the science and this is really all you need to know. Number one, it's happening. Uh, I'm indebted to Byron Smith, by the way, who might be on this call for this, this schema. Number one, it's happening. And we've known it's been happening for well and truly over um, 150 years now. So 1856, uh, scientist Eunice Newton Foote in the US discovered that if you put carbon dioxide in a bottle, it heated up more rapidly, it heated up faster, uh, heated up more and cooled down slower than a variety of other gases. Water vapour, she discovered, did something similar. She is the first scientist. Um, John Tyndall, a couple of years later, demonstrated it under uh, lab conditions as well uh, in the UK. So scientists have actually been able to demonstrate that carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases have this heat trapping or radiation absorbing and, and re-radiating effect. So they've been able to demonstrate that these gases in the atmosphere are going to warm the earth and without them actually the earth would be too cold for us to be here having this conversation. No life would exist. So having these um, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere is what keeps the planet habitable. Climate change is, uh, so global warming is happening. Let me bring up a very quick um, view of global warming over the 20th century and into the 21st century. Areas of blue are areas that were cooler than the 20th century average. Areas of yellow, orange, and red are areas that have been hotter than the 20th century average. And it's pretty clear from this very short presentation that the earth has heated over the course of the 20th century. Uh, it has warmed by just over a degree Celsius above where it was at prior to the Industrial Revolution. So first thing that we all need to know, and I think do know, is global warming is happening. If you're under the age of five, or if you've been alive for the last five years, you have lived through the five hottest years on record. Um, if you are under the age of 34, you have never experienced a single month that was cooler than the average temperature for the 20th century. Not a single month, not the coldest winter globally um, has been uh, over the last 422 months, consecutive months, has been cooler than the 20th century average. We have entered a new climate regime. So it's happening. Second thing is it's us 
And I want to be really clear here because sometimes um, webinars or conferences or whatever about global warming or climate change can come across as a bit guilt trippy. You know, you're all causing climate change or we're all causing climate change. There's a way in which that's true. We'll discuss that later. But actually, I really want to take the guilt off our shoulders because I didn't create the energy system that Australia uses to power our homes. I didn't create the transport network that we use to get around. And sure, I make use of those things. I have a responsibility. Again, we'll talk about this later. But I didn't set up these systems. I didn't profit from these systems. If I could go back in time and reorient ourselves around more sustainable systems, I would do so. So I want to be really clear. It's happening and it's us. Human greenhouse gas emissions, particularly CO2 through the burning of coal, oil and gas, but also deforestation and industrial scale agriculture, we have caused global warming. Um, but it's not just us. It's certainly not people in Nepal, as we'll discuss a little later. The companies who've profited, about 90 to 100 companies are responsible for around two thirds of the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere since the Industrial Revolution. And they have emitted more in the last 30 years than they emitted in the entire you know, 150 odd years leading up to that point. So when I say it's us, actually I want to focus in on a handful of companies and the governments that facilitate their work and refuse to rein them in as being primarily responsible. And let me just show you a very quick video indicating that one of these companies, a leading company, both in terms of its size and scale, one of the wealthiest countries, companies in the history of the world, um, has dedicated the last 20 years to misleading, misinforming the public and deliberately working to undermine policy choices that might have put us on um, a safer climate pathway. And that's ExxonMobil, but many other companies um, have contributed to this as well. Proponents of the global warming theory say that higher levels of greenhouse gases, especially CO2, are causing world temperatures to rise and that burning fossil fuels is the reason. But scientific evidence remains inconclusive as to whether human activities affect the global climate. There is simply no reason to take drastic action now. Thank you. 
So uh, just to sum up that video, Exxon Mobil scientists knew and projected very accurately likely um, atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide and the associated temperature rise um, in the 60s and 70s. In the 80s, 90s and beyond, they then worked to actively hide that information away and to deceive the public about um, the nature of climate change. Their own scientists' work was uh, cast into doubt by ExxonMobil entirely to preserve their profits and the profits of the fossil fuel industry um, so that they could continue to extract as much coal, oil and gas from the earth as possible, set it on fire to do all the things, wonderful things that it does uh, when we do that, um, regardless, heedless of the consequences. In fact, not heedless of, knowing the consequences and choosing to, um, yeah, to promote their profits over that regardless. So it's happening, it's us human beings, but I really want you to focus your attention there because actually the change that we need to make isn't just my own personal choices about whether I get a bus instead of drive a car, whether I use, uh, different light bulbs in my house or whatever, actually the change needs to go at, to the level of how our electricity is produced, how our transportation happens, and we're fighting against some very wealthy, well-resourced companies and vested interests. Third thing that we, that we understand from the science, but we understand I think fairly deep in our hearts, is it's bad. Climate change is not a neutral thing. There aren't net benefits, net negatives, it comes out even or, in, you know, it's, a bad thing and it's particularly bad for the most vulnerable people, for the most vulnerable creatures uh, and for generations still to come. So for all of these reasons I think Christian should care. I um, just want to highlight that on the webinars page uh, I've uploaded a, a PDF document with lots of links and resources uh, going into more detail about some of the stuff that Sahara and I will talk about. So if you want to follow up on any of the things we mention in these um, presentations, please go to inf.org slash webinars, go to the climate change webinar section and download that PDF. It's free. Um, you're very welcome to have it. Uh, I won't go into too much detail, except if you're an Australian, everyone in the world has just lived through the hottest summer ever recorded, uh, global summer, uh, Northern Hemisphere summer, um, in history. We have gone through the hottest global January uh, recorded, and we've gone through, if not the, certainly one of the largest fire events ever, to, well, certainly the largest fire event to occur in Australia in recorded history, and globally, um, a wave of fires, including a wave of fires in the last few years, in places that have, to, in living memory, never or almost never burnt. Parts of Australia, rainforest, temperate rainforest uh, in Tasmania, rainforest in Queensland um, and other parts of Australia. In the Arctic, areas of forest that have never or almost never burnt. And that is a signal of things to come. So climate change is already causing impacts uh, that damage um, the environment, that harm communities, that take lives, that kill creatures that God has created and loves, um, and that will themselves cause feedback loops. Um, as forests uh, burn, they release their carbon into the atmosphere. Um, as they regenerate, they regenerate not you know, as they were before, but um, less robust in many cases, more prone to fire in the future. Our Pacific Island nations keep reminding Australia that climate change is an existential threat for them. Communities in Fiji, in Papua New Guinea, in Tuvalu, uh, in the Marshall Islands, in the Cook Islands are already being relocated from coastal settlements into other parts uh, of their nations where they have places to move. And some nations are already thinking about what it will mean for them 
to lose their land entirely. So it is causing impacts now at one degree of warming. We are no longer in a safe climate space. The urgent action is, as the world has agreed, to keep warming to less than one and a half degrees, certainly less than two degrees. We'll have some news about that in a moment. It's happening, it's us, it's bad. But the fourth thing I wanna say, and this does stray a little out from just purely the science, but I just wanna say, actually we can act. We can move from uh, the current highly polluting um, global economy, agriculture and transport systems that we face, that we use, into a much more sustainable, low emissions um, economy, global economy, and set of uh, uh, relationships between nations that also reduce poverty. Um, the Overseas Development Institution uh, Institute, this is just a graphic I've picked from there, just a nice little cartoon, summing up some of the linkages between tackling poverty and tackling climate change. And they've, uh, in some research of a few years ago, 2015, estimated that 720 million people are likely to be pushed back into or into, for the first time, extreme poverty if climate change is not addressed in the next decade. So the work that we've, that we've begun to overcome global poverty um, could be undone by climate change. We're already seeing that happen with malnutrition and hunger. After almost a decade of progress against hunger, fewer and fewer people experiencing hunger, malnutrition um, trending in a positive direction. Actually, over the last two years, we've seen hunger, the number of people experiencing regular hunger and associated impacts of malnutrition increase. So responding to climate change is both a matter of ecological necessity and urgency, but also of human rights and justice. That's all you need to know about the science. It's happening, we're causing it, brackets, primarily a whole bunch of highly polluting corporations uh, and the governments that they uh, influence to let them keep doing what they do. Uh, it's not good. In fact, it's very, very bad and will continue to get worse. And we can take action to mitigate the effects and also um, reduce the scale of the problem. And every action we take now will pay dividends in less, uh, yeah, in less problems uh, stored up for us in the future. I want to briefly talk about um, the Bible and theology, and I just want to do it through the angle of the faithfulness of God. Again, the document has a lot more um, kind of theological reflection and resource in it, but I think one of the critical questions that people um, come up with or come up against when they think about climate change is if God is faithful, how could the climate be disrupted in this way? If God is faithful and good, how could we be facing catastrophic events that will displace entire nations, that will harm God's creation in irreversible ways, that will lead to um, hunger, starvation, increased levels of conflict around resources and land, um, and so on. If God is good and faithful, how could any of those things be happening? So I'm just going to uh, hinted a few things that are dealt with a little more fully in the document, um, but interested to see what people's questions are. The first thing I want to say is God is faithful. Um, and we know this because we see God in the face and life and work and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Paul says in Romans 8, I'm summarizing slightly, he asks it as, as a question, which he then goes on to answer, who can separate us from the love of God in Christ? Nobody and nothing. So Paul, in summary, says in Romans 8, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ. But Paul, in that very sentence, who can, what can separate us from the love of God in Christ, goes on to list a whole range of terrible calamities, some of which are, are maybe at the individual or personal level, but some of which are at the nation, um, the city-state, the regional, perhaps even the global level, Paul doesn't say that nothing bad can ever happen. Paul doesn't say that no civilization collapsing calamity could ever occur because he says, for nothing can separate us from the love of God. Hardship, distress, 
persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword. So Paul doesn't say nothing bad can ever happen, doesn't say that God's faithfulness protects us from civilization level calamities, but he says none of those things, not even height and depth um, or any power in all of creation can separate us from the love of God in Christ. We know that God is faithful, but it doesn't mean that things can't get bad. And the second thing, God is faithful in creation. And I just want to um, show up two very quick, um, well, three uh, graphics. Sometimes when people hear um, people talking about the environment or ecology or climate change, they hear this message that actually the, the, the first diagram that the climate is very fragile, that God has created a world kind of perfectly poised on top of a very steep hill. And if something even gets slightly out of whack, we're headed for a downhill ride um, to calamity. And often people feel that that makes us feel very unsettled, this idea that the earth is so fragile and the climate system so fragile that we could disrupt it. A counter view is that actually, the second um, image, that we're living in a very stable climate and there's very little we could do to disrupt it. Um, we're at the bottom of this nice, safe cup. Maybe we can shift it a little bit either side, but we'll roll back into the center inevitably anyway. Um, is that the kind of world God has created? Uh, a world that's so safe and so secure and the climate is so stable that nothing we do could make any difference. And actually, I think both the Bible and science tell us that this is the kind of world God has created. A stable, secure climate one in which life can thrive and flourish and all those beautiful blessings we read about in Genesis 1 on human beings and all of creation can um, be experienced, but actually one that we're able to disrupt. When God gives us responsibility to bear his image, to represent him in the world, to have stewardship or dominion over creation, God gives us real authority. It's not just make believe. It's not a pretend act on God. I'm going to say you can have dominion, but actually, really, I don't mean it. I'll make sure everything turns out okay. God gives us real responsibility. Dominion really means authority and power to act and change the world, including in ways that are for our harm and for the harm of the creation God has made. And God will allow us to wear the consequences of those choices. So God is faithful in creation, creating a space in which we can all thrive, but faithful to the mandate he gives us in creation, which is for human beings to be his image bearers um, and exercise responsible dominion in and with creation. And where we fail to live up to that task, um, harm can come. And finally, I'm just gonna say, uh, when it comes to climate change, God is faithful to the world, because he has a people. He's set aside a people um, who will be his royal people, who will be a royal priesthood in the world. And I just want to reflect ever so briefly on the story of Esther. Esther, in the Bible, as you remember, faces a, a circumstance where in the um, Persian Empire, her people, the Jews, the people of God, Israel, are facing a threat that will exterminate them all across the empire. She's not aware of this threat, but um, a relative of hers, Mordecai, is aware. And he tells her, this is what's happening and you need to speak to the king to stop it. And she tries to avoid acting. She says to Mordecai, no one can go into the king's chamber. It's forbidden for anyone to go in without being invited, even the queen, on pain of death. If I was to walk in and tell the king about this plot and ask him to do something to stop it, I would be executed. Um, and Mordecai says, well, actually, you're in the same boat as everybody. He'll find out at some point that you also are a Jew. Um, and rather than waiting for help or hope from somewhere else, Mordecai asks this question or makes this statement. Perhaps you have come to royal dignity for such a time as this. Perhaps the reason you are queen right now is so that you can go in and speak to the king, even though it's risking your life to do so, even though it's breaking the law to do so. So I just like to challenge Christians to think maybe the circumstance we're in now is something similar, that we have been raised to royal dignity as God's royal priesthood, 
as sons of the Son of God and daughters of the Son of God um, to be people who speak up and take action to hold our rulers to account, to protect vulnerable communities of people and creation. I'm nearly the end of my, my section. So just very quickly, what I think we can do. First thing we need to stand with those affected. Um, I'm gonna put it really bluntly. If you are not supporting a community development organization like INF that works with communities affected by climate change and helps them develop the resilience and the resources to cope, both with poverty and injustice they face all the time and increasingly with climate impacts, you should be. God gives us um, gifts and blessings in order for us to share those with others. I think INF is excellent. I think you should support us. But whoever you are supporting, you should do that wholeheartedly and open-handedly. Um, you should pray. I would love to encourage you to have climate conversations, talk about this stuff, break down the climate silence that makes us think maybe other people don't care about this as much. Actually, all the evidence is people want to have climate conversations. What's happening? How do we feel about it? And what can we do to make a difference? We've got lots of ideas in the document about ways to make personal and household change that will have an impact. You're not responsible for climate change, but there are things you can do that will help minimize your impact, live lightly in the world God has given us all. I really encourage you if you live in a democracy like Australia's uh, or in Nepal, to talk to your elected representatives at national, state and local level and really encourage or challenge them to do what they need to do to ensure a safe climate for all. And finally, I'd like to encourage you to work for social change. This is not just an individual level thing. We need to shift society. I'll point you to two resources as I finish. Uh, INF Australia has a directed giving program called Journey with Joomla that supports communities in Joomla uh, in the far west of Nepal, um, particularly women, building their capacity to respond to the issues they face, including climate change. And if you are not already connected with something like the School Strike for Climate um, or a similar event in your place, please do look them up and consider attending when we're all um, able to get out of our homes again sometime in the future, I hope. Um, consider attending a rally to speak up and raise your voice about climate change. Thank you for letting me rattle on for a little while. I'm going to finish my section and hand over to Sahara to talk about climate impacts in Nepal. So I would like to share my PowerPoint. Um, can you hear me? We can. Everything's great. Yeah, okay. So, namaste and good afternoon, everyone, again. I hope you all are doing good. And today I'm pretty excited to have this opportunity to share about things on climate change. And uh, climate change is indeed a, indeed a very interesting subject. So, um, I would like to start uh, with giving you a brief uh, background information on Nepal. So uh, this is the map of Nepal. Nepal is a landlocked country which is sandwiched between two world's giants, China in the north and India in the southeast and the west. It is a small country having the area of 147,181 uh, square kilometers. Geographically, Nepal is divided into three parts, Himalaya, Reason, Mid Hills, uh, uh, Hilly Reason and Tara Reason, as you can see in the map. The Tarai stretches from uh, 60 meter above the sea level to 1,000 meter above the sea level and covers 17% of the total landmass. The hilly region stretches from 1,000 meter above the sea level to 3,000 meter that covers 68% of the total landmass of the country. While the Himalayan region, as you can see in the white and the light gray, 
It, is, it covers 15% of the total landmass of Nepal that stretches from 3,000 meter to uh, 8,848 meters above the sea level. Definitely the horizontal landmass of the country is small compared to its vertical mass it has acquired. <clears throat> World's eight of the top 10 mountains are located in Nepal. So having such a variation in altitude, the temperature of the country also varies from Tarai to Himalaya. Nepal has five climatic conditions, uh, climatic zones based on altitude. They are tropical, subtropical, cool temperate, cold and alpine climatic zones. And Nepal enjoys five seasons, summer, monsoon, autumn, winter and spring spring, blessing the country with different types of floras and faunas in overall the biodiversity. <clears throat> Nepal is very rich in biodiversity and is also considered as one of the research hub among the environmentalists around the uh, world. Nepal has recorded uh, 12, sorry, 12,000 plants and fungus species, 208 mammal species, 867 birds, 123 reptiles, 117 amphibians, 230 fish, 651 butterflies, 3,958 species of moths, and 175 species of spiders. Nepal is highly an agrarian country. More than 68% of the total population of Nepal is dependent on agriculture. The agriculture contributes to 26.8% 20, of the national GDP. However, the agriculture is highly dependent on the rainfall and only a few areas in the plains are facilitated with irrigation facility. <coughs> Nepal is a tourism country. Nepal is naturally blessed country with nature. Studies showed that the foreigners who have once been in Nepal usually come back to Nepal aside the holidays is the people of Nepal for their hospitality. The tourism contributes 7.9% of the country's GDP. With the small information on the background of Nepal, I would like to highlight on what is and how is the scenario of climate change for Nepal. To be honest, almost a decade back when I was at high school, uh, word climate change was still an unknown, unknown word to me. We only used to uh, study about the pollution, greenhouse gases, just greenhouse gases and carrying capacity of the earth and not the word climate change. I was not so familiar with the word climate change. Now we were taught that the uh, greenhouse gases <clears throat> makes holes in the ozone layer and only the harmful rays will enter the earth. The temperature of earth will also increase and so there will be more problems. We're taught of vehicles and industries are the major sources of carbon emissions. And as I began to fill my knowledge in this sector, I found Climate emission for uh, climate, sorry, carbon emission for Nepal is negligible. It is 0.02 percent in world share. It is uh, as the Department of Agriculture reports in 2016. <coughs> Nepal is fourth for climate uh, vulnerability, as Global Climate Risk Index in 2019 reports. It's the 136th nation for climate resilience as per the study conducted by Notre Dame Global, uh, uh, Glo uh, Global Adaptation Initiative. Uh, among uh, the research conducted among uh, 192 countries in the world. Uh, the climate resilience is measured on the capacity versus risk. Indeed, the resources is far less compared to the vulnerability and risks to climate change, given the increasing temperature from the climate change. The average annual temperature increase for the country is 0 0.056 degrees centigrade, uh, while of the Himalayas is even more. Uh, as the uh, uh, DHN, uh, Department of Hydrology and Meteorology uh, reports in 2017, uh, the Himalayan district Manan has the uh, record increase of temperature by 0.092 degrees centigrade, while the Persa, the uh, district of Tarai region, has <clears throat> the increase of 0.017 degrees centigrade. This is indeed an alarming situation for Nepal. 
glacier release. So this picture is here is one of the examples of climate change impacts in Himalayan region. I have taken this picture from the sources of ECMOD, which is an expert uh, international uh, organization working for uh, glaciers. <clears throat> the pictures are supported in the study of uh, the picture support supports the study of the glacial lakes. And this is uh, uh, this picture is of the Tulagi Lake, which is situated at the northwest of Manas Mount Manasalu, which it is one of the highest um, mountain in Nepal. And and this particular uh, glacial lake is located in Manang village. The glacial lake was comparatively small in 1991, as you can see uh, here with the red uh, red arrow. And uh, as uh, two decades later, you can see uh, through the yellow arrow, it has expanded considerably. Uh, uh, this is one of the 21 critical lakes that has been assessed to have the potentiality of having the glacial lakes outburst. Among these 21, the two lakes, Injache and uh, Chorolpa has been low, lake lowered. And this is also in the list, priority list of the government to reduce the impact of outburst floods for the communities living downstream through lake lowering. However, because of the increase in the temperature, the glaciers are retreating day by day and they are amplifying in size and this is increasing the potentiality of glacier lakes outburst. Glacier lakes, glacier loss over the past five years is the highest that in more of a century, glaciers are the source of fresh water and are the reserve for future, future too. Losing such precious uh, water sources of fresh waters are, uh, are, is an alarming situation for future and this causes the water crisis that impacts several aspects of life. Water crisis. The second picture here is about the water crisis that is induced by extreme dry spells from the um, climate change. Nepal, though, is known as the second richest country in the world for water resources. Nepalese are facing the water crisis daily in their lives. Nepal is ranked 14th in the global index and marked high water stressed countries by the World Resource Institute in 2019. Keeping aside the unmanaged urban settlement and geographical um, uh, location, climate change has increased the hotter days and torrential rainfall. This has caused the disaster to come and, pro and prolong dry and hot days. People living in villages used to walk miles to fetch two jars of water and now the impact is more compared to what they were already struggling. As seen in the picture, it is female uh, who fetches water for their household course. This makes them more confined on their household activities and less time for their productive activities. This surely is a challenge to gender mainstreaming as well. In, and in addition, there are also news of occurrence of fights while fetching water. This is also leading to social disharmony. Um, food production. Um, <clears throat> uh, the, the, the picture here uh, is rice. This plant is rice. And um, the best and the earliest detection of climate change is visible to the plant phenology anyway. So I've taken rice as an example. Rice is the main food of Nepal. From the end of May till end of June, most of the rice plants are planted. However, due to the climate change and change in climatic pattern, the rice cultivation has been impacted. Rice, rice needs more water to grow and fruit. However, having very less to no water destroys the plant. This results in less food production and sometimes famine too, leading food insecurity. The farmers who are dependent only on agriculture are living under the poverty line. <clears throat> and um, this scenario directly impacts in the income uh, source resulting in crisis in their living uh, from food to education to health and other accesses and other facilities. The hierarchy of social status influenced by economies, economic status also shows more gap, making these people more vulnerable. Uh, not only for the crops like rice, 
there are other different crops also crops also affected by the climate change impact uh, climate change so the human diseases um, pandemic like uh, coronavirus COVID-19 a pandemic like dengue can be taken as the recent examples resulted by one of the factors called climate change uh, I shall not directly emphasize these uh, diseases to, to solve climate change as this needs vectors like ticks, flies, mosquitoes, bacteria, and virus. However, the climate change does have the role in increasing the tolerance, uh, transmission, and also the DNA assemblance from the increase in temperature. The diseases and its symptoms are not new to human, but the effects. The medicine that used to cure dengue previously is less effective to dengue compared to today. Dengue used to be common in Tarai, but now it's also found in hills too. Last year, Okara had witnessed uh, the dengue outbreak as well. That, that was uh, not a common thing. The common cold that used to last for three days previously now lasts for more than a week. The rise in temperature has fostered new diseases and helped other diseases to reappear and also become adaptive. And this is same for the plant and animal as well. Uh, with the increased immune and the new diseases being seen in plant and animals, um, the agriculture and livestock rearing is um, highly impacted, impacting the incomes and the in uh, sources of income of farmers in Nepal. And uh, not to uh, forget, like climate change also supports a more disaster scenario. This picture is from the Rotat response. <clears throat> uh, this year we had a we had flood uh, in Tarai district, and this is the place where INF Nepal had gone for the emergency relief support. And uh, not to forget the most recent Australian bushfire and the drought is the result of the climate change. It has been reported. Uh, by the statement on the state of global climate. Europe was hard hit from the heat waves this year with the record-breaking temperature rise. The statement also reports that 2019 has surpassed the 1.1 degree global average above pre-industrial pre levels. And the past five years has been the hottest years ever recorded. With this, there are no dilemmas in saying that disaster scenarios like this will like this, drought, floods, fires, landslide, epidemics, gloves will be more frequent in future. This, was, uh, this will result in a uh, loss of number of lives, lives on earth, not just human, and the destruction of the infrastructures. The issues and uh, impacts are rooted in every aspect. Two decades back, when Nepal became the member of UNFCC in 1994, it started to work with the issues, but it was not uh, the hot cake as it at, uh, hot cake before as it is now. The country was slowly understanding the climate change, and as the uh, first state, Nepal developed um, Napa. Sorry, Napa in 2009 and is in operation. National plan. National Plan of Adaptation Action, National Adaptation Plan of Action, NAPA. NAPA was uh, helped. NAPA helped in mapping and operating climate change adaptation projects uh, in identifying the vulnerable households, community risk reduction, and increase in community resilience. Similarly, it formed Climate Change uh, Council in 2009. We have a Climate Change Coordination Committee and Climate Change uh, Management Division on the Ministry of Forest and Environment, which is a focal point for coordination and climate issues. With the more policies and plan in uh, line, climate policy 2000, uh, climate policy 2000, uh, 12 was ratified. It also uh, uh, that climate uh, change policy 2012 had introduced community forest uh, program that helped in reducing the greenhouse gases uh, emission, uh, and it was a huge success as well. At the time passed, there was a need to update the policy, and therefore in 2019 we have a new climate change policy, and. 
is currently in action. The new climate policy is more rigid and has addressed several sectors. Similarly, Nepal has national red policy, a reduction of a carbon emission from forest destruction and a deforestation. Climate change financing uh, framework and budget code is in practice to Nepal Planning Commission. And green growth strategies are also in line. Gender mainstreaming in climate, climate change action plan and nationally determined indicators and other instruments are also available to assess and address the climate change impacts in Nepal. Currently, Nepal is planning for the low carbon economic development strategy and national strategy for carbon trade. On 2019, the first ever National Climate Change Conference was held at Sindhu Paljog that and that uh, that came out with 10 point Sindhu Paljog declaration that aims to institutionalize uh, climate change friendly plans and policies and promote climate change adaptation and mitigation strategies as the national, provincial and uh, local level. Furthermore, Nepal is the signatory of several of the national and international protocols policies like Sendai Framework, Kyoto Protocol, uh, Kyoto Protocol, Sustainable Development Goals, and more. Nepal has also worked and is working in 10 clean development uh, mechanism projects that includes water meal project, solar energy, improved cooking stops, biogas plant, and microhydros. Um, Nepal is also processing to prepare nationally adapted uh, adaptation, national adaptation plan and update nationally determined contribution on the Paris Agreement, accept the Doha Amendment on the Kyoto Protocol and accredite national government and international government organization to assess the global climate funds. In order to support the initiative of government in addressing climate change and in adaptation measures, Several of the national and international organizations have been working on ground. Programs like a National Climate Change Support Program implemented by UNDP mainstreaming LAPA in 100 villages of 14 districts of West Nepal worked vigorously to raise awareness and work on climate change issues. Similarly, renewable energy for rural livelihood supported in alternative energy sources at the rural areas of Nepal with the support uh, of providing solar powers. Um, Community-based flood and glacial lake outburst risk reduction program. This has supported in lake lowering of the two lakes I mentioned, Chorulpa and Injache. Uh, and clean development mechanic pro, uh, mechanism projects are supporting for the clean uh, energy uh, sources. And um, projects like ecosystem-based adaptation projects and the Haryoban projects, they are supporting the livelihood through environmental conservation and habitat pro uh, protection. Similarly, climate resilient agriculture practice and implementation of ecotourism in Nepal are steps done by the several of the national and international organizations liaising with the Nepal government to address the climate change. As for INF Nepal, a local NGO, <coughs> like mentioned earlier, climate change is not a new term but also not a very familiar term and rigor rigorously worked uh, topic. Hence, there are few projects addressing climate change in INF Nepal. Um, uh, they are, uh, the core ones are role for climate change, improved stops. These are the, uh, and uh, role for climate change has already been uh, completed. Uh, EES project, Environment and Economic Sustainability project implemented in Bajura. It's the new project that INF Nepal has, which has the core um, uh, subject on, um, which has a corely addressed climate change through agriculture and waste management. And in integrated projects, INF Nepal has ideal project Mugu and Bajura, simple project in Kapilvastu, Educate Rolpa, and Kali Code project. Among these uh, projects, I would like to talk about Rolpa Climate Change because uh, Rol uh, Rolpa is the working area of the previously uh, Disaster Response and Resilience Department as well. And I have some uh, kind of familiar familiarity with Rolpa, so I, have, I can talk a little bit about Rolpa uh, project. So, um, uh, in um, 
Road Park Climate Change uh, was, uh, an, was a 18 month project uh, with the overall goal to sustain the livelihood and improve the quality of life of the people affected by the impacts of climate change in Rolpa. The major activities involved uh, were to promote uh, modern farming and uh, provide technical support to the people, reduce the disaster risk through community participatory assessment on disaster risk, provide training and awareness against uh, traditional belief and malpractices on health, hygiene, and sanitation and environmental degradation, support in prevention of river age cutting by floods, support in developing livelihood farming and at a local level, action plan support to solve environmental and sanitation related issues, training and support for improved stops and coordination and networking meetings with like-minded organizations and groups. All these activities were carried out through the self-help groups that I had, INF Nepal had formed and, and had worked with. The overall objective from all these activities were to, uh, was to capacitate communities to mobilize themselves to act together and be safe on the common issues and impacts of climate change and save the environment. Though we have known, seen, heard, and experienced the impacts of climate change, though we have received plans, frameworks, policies, goals, interventions, and alliances on place, there are certain challenges for the country, like-minded organization, and also for INF Nepal to uh, get the to achieve the goal in addressing the climate change. Nepal is one of the least developed countries in the world, and about 20% of the population lives below the poverty line. The major occupation is farming, and thus it confirms the economy of the farmers are not well as defined as the um, people who are involved in industries and businesses. Uh, hence, the most of the Nepalese are living in poverty with um, just enough for the survival and are uneducated. People are somehow literate to a label nowadays, which is confirmed by the study showing the high dropouts in villages. Therefore, people with less education and poverty shall not care what hampers the environment. They will care on their survival through minimal cost payment. They will not be bothered about what happens if they use and dispose plastics haphazardly, or will they be bothered uh, to save the trees or conserve the environment around? Their sole goal is for the survival and live a predefined normal life. The, and that is where the challenge becomes complex. In order to survive through the poverty and provide the basic needs to the family, the trend of migration to the cities and abroad is increasing in Nepal. <clears throat> and that leaves children, female and elderly at home. Female thus needs to stay at home taking care of the elderly and, and, um, um, and, uh, and uh, uh, female are just bound to uh, work in their households and not beyond their household. The increase in population is another uh, challenge. The need is more than the supply. Therefore, any easy methods to fulfill the demand is in practice that is not caring about the environment or emission. Furthermore, there is no uniformity in understanding the issues of climate change and coordination among the intersectoral stakeholders. And there is no or very less researches and studies being done for the climate hazards. And, the, uh, and in order to inform and aware people on this, it is also seen as the gap and challenge. Even though <clears throat> we have plans and policies and also the frameworks online, but integration or, or mainstreaming climate change adaptation in, uh, in development work is a different story in a real scenario. Uh, and for the more for the organization like INF Nepal, the uh, or less organizational capacity, fund technology, and knowledge on climate change adaptation is also a challenge. This is a technical subject. Uh, activities are mostly intangible and takes years to sprout or to be less or sorry, or to be seen on ground. The global funds like GCF, GEF are uh, 
the only ones that support for longer period and short term interventions like one year or two year on climate change are barely fruitful. Uh, uh, this is one of the challenges NGO faces. People want to see the challenge happen shortly or they want the physical evidence, but for the um, issues like cl climate change, it's more about the uh, it's more about intangible things and raising awareness and it seeks the behavioral change and behave to change uh, to have the behavioral change it takes a long time and uh, climate change is not just a change in climate but a uh, but uh, but an overall change in the system which is caused by the people's choices and decisions and to revert and to uh, make it all like how it was it takes time so these are the challenges and uh, with this note i would like to say thank you and if there are any questions we can tahara thank you so much for such a really informative um uh overview of of climate change impacts in nepal the challenges faced and a really encouraging and heartening reflection on um yes even for one of the poorest and most vulnerable countries in the world government civil society inf working to try to rise to this challenge um i just really appreciated how you managed to link so many aspects of this interrelated um thing we call climate change from its impact on food security poverty um the gendered impacts of climate change and responding to climate change um those new phenomenon uh dengue fever being experienced in parts of the country that have never felt it before or pests that have never been seen in parts of the country for the first time in recent years being seen that you took us through a lot of information and you covered a lot of ground and you did it really well so thank you so much um, we are just over time, so we have gone past our one hour um, uh, time frame. So for those who need to leave the webinar, please feel free uh, at any time to leave. We'll stay on. There, there haven't been um, there haven't been any other uh, messages or questions yet, but feel free to add some questions just before we move into seeing if there are questions coming up on the chat pane. Um, the document, the downloadable PDF uh, is there on uh, inf.org slash webinars. I'll send the link through by email again after this call. Um, both Sahara and my PowerPoint presentations will be uploaded uh, in the not too distant future within the next couple of days. So I'll send an email to people to download that. And the recording of this webinar, a link to that will be sent out to you guys which if you want to share it with uh, people who couldn't be part of uh, the call, feel free to send that around as well. So I'll give you maybe 30 seconds just to see if any, any other questions do come up on the chat pane. Okay, Anna has asked, can you go over what are the most effective things we can do? Um, I might take it first and then from my perspective and then ask Sahara from her perspective what she thinks. Um, and for those who have to leave, absolutely, please feel free, go, uh, go in grace and look forward to meeting you again some other time. <laughs> Workmates, they're the worst. Um, <laughs> he, he's our finance officer. He didn't know about the webinar. So oh, just cool. oh, that's great. Um, great question, Anna. My, my personal take on it, is whatever the most ambitious thing you can imagine yourself doing that is the most effective thing you can do um this is if it ever was this is no longer a you know choose one thing and do it or a little thing or small actions will scale up to something bigger this is a situation where actually all hands are needed on deck responding in multiple ways um so i bring it down to two things, uh, what we can do to support those who are affected by climate change, whether it's our neighbours in Nepal, in the Pacific or elsewhere. So standing in solidarity or young people, um, uh, indigenous populations in Australia. And the second thing is, what are the most ambitious things we can do to shift the dial in a country like Australia? 
Um, and to my mind right now, that looks like uh, major and potentially disruptive demonstrations that make it clear to our political elected leaders and to uh, those who profit off um, the causes of climate change that this situation can't stay. There's a lot of things you can do uh, as well. Take your money out of fossil fuels. Talk to your bank, talk to your superannuation or investment funds if, if you have those things. Take your money away from fossil fuels. But raise your voice to elected leaders, raise your voice in public and organise collectively to disrupt the status quo. What do you think in terms of what are the most effective things you think we can do to respond to climate change, Sahara? Uh, what I think is everyone um, has a choice they, they, uh, they make. So rethinking the choice, uh, refusing the items for sing that is uh, for single use, reducing the consumption of, for example, the plastics, reusing whatever you can, refurbishing the old stuff. Because uh, when I was abroad, I saw lots of things that they don't need are on the street. So that can be refurbished as well. And repair before you replace and repurpose the thing that you no longer need. Just be creative on what you can and have the uh, recycling as the last resort because recycling also means emission included in there. So, so it's a bit more like rethinking the choices for me. Yeah, wonderful. And they they go together. What what we do at home affirms our identity and our values as people who care about these issues. And then that also hopefully encourages and empowers us to go out and seek to make wider change, not just in the household. Um, Cheryl asked, what are some specific things we can speak to our elected representatives about? We might, there's a whole bunch of good resources out and about. Um, I would point people towards the School Strike for Climate that's got a very clear set of arms that they want to put to our elected representatives. So I'm very happy to, to affirm what they're standing for. Um, uh, but essentially, we need to be getting emissions to zero as quickly as we can. Countries like Australia need to be leading in that, not lagging as we currently are. And we need to be supporting uh, nations like Nepal to pursue that um, low carbon development pathway that Sahara talked about and adapting to the changes that they're already experiencing, the impacts they're already experiencing. And Jill King has reminded that even with um, the current situation with coronavirus confining a lot of people to home or, or obviously stopping large mass rallies, there are still online actions and School Strike for Climate are um, taking uh, online action as well. So please do um, get involved in an action of some kind and please do look around at what changes you can make in your own life and in your own household. I think we might leave it there. We've, we've covered a lot of ground. Thank you so much for the questions. Thank you for um, staying with us uh, during the webinar, everybody. Like I said, I'll upload all of these links and share them with you very soon. Um, Oh, and look, I'll leave with this last question from Sharon, uh, who works for INF in Nepal. I'm really, really glad that we've got um, friends and colleagues from Australia and uh, Nepal. Um, Sharon has said, how as INF can we have a common understanding about climate change so that our staff at the field level who are the implementers are clear in their activities and interventions? And I'm just going to say, um, Sahara, she's not the only one, she's not the sole person responsible, we've all got to act on this, but having Sahara in her role as our technical uh, officer for climate adaptation is such a wonderful step to helping integrate um, effective understanding and clear interventions and activities that build climate resilience and ad adaptive capacity across all our projects. So I look forward to sharing with you guys, maybe in six months, maybe a year, some of the outcomes of the work that we're that we're all working on together in this area. So I want to say good night and God bless and Sahara. Namaste everyone. Thank you for joining in. <laughs> Thank you, Ben. No worries. Thank you. All right. Talk to you all some other time.
Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.